So this is the uh, first of our question answer uh, videos. Thanks for the uh, question. So I, I picked out three set of questions, three sets of questions I thought were um, particularly perceptive. So the first dealt with the uh, the Barbary Wars, uh, which were uh, during the Jefferson administration, remember from the first of the, the snippets, and this is essentially an undeclared naval war by the United States. Um, with the Barbary uh, state, so Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Tripoli, which is modern day um, uh, Libya, um, that ran from 1803 until um, 1805, 1806. Um, the United States never declared war on, uh, on any of these uh, countries. And <laughs> the basic um, thrust here was that the Barbary states demanded a... Uh, a a fee, we could call it, um, uh, in exchange for an agreement uh, not to have pirates from their countries attack foreign vessels. And the, the French and the Prussians and the uh, uh, British decided that it was really um, not worth the inconvenience to try to, uh, to try to fight them on this. The Americans refused to do so. The result was a war. Um, Jefferson believed that foreign commerce was critical for keeping the country agrarian, um, but was also worried that um, an outright war could be problematic. So the result was this, this undeclared naval war, which the United States did Prevail. The Barbary states were were quite weak. Um, for those of you who know European history, this had been the outer fringes of the Ottoman Empire, and as the Ottoman Empire becomes weaker in the uh, late 1700s, uh, the Barbary states break away and become de facto independent. Uh, France eventually will colonize Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, and um, uh, uh, Italy uh, colonizes uh, colonizes Libya. So the questions were, um, was there pushback on uh, Jefferson's uh, uh, action? Remember, he did not request a, a declaration of war against uh, the, these countries uh, through Congress. Um, and did it have an impact on uh, presidential powers in relation to foreign affairs? And the second question um, uh, relates on uh, the, the uh, impact in, in terms of North Africa and the United States? Did it affect the transatlantic uh, slave trade? And how did, uh, how did Americans uh, react? So starting with the second question uh, first, it by and large does not have a long-term uh, impact on either the, the slave trade, because the Barbary states weren't too, too involved in the slave trade. The slave trade is primarily coming from Western Africa. Um, and the Barbary states themselves quickly have other uh, problems. The, the, the French actually will colonize Algeria in 18, uh, 1830. And the United States, um, in, in the, this is the, the, the Barbary states is actually the origins of the US involvement in the, uh, in the Middle East. But the, uh, the US will quickly turn its attention away from North Africa to um, uh, the Ottoman Empire. It will eventually establish relation, diplomatic relations with the Ottoman Empire. There's some talk of aiding the Greeks during the Greek War of Independence in 1830. 30, and the U.S. becomes very interested in establishing Christian missionaries here in the Levant, um, mostly modern day uh, Lebanon and, uh, and Syria. So the long term impact in terms of U.S. North African relations from this conflict is, is relatively min minimal. The impact in terms of U.S. constitutional history is quite significant because this along with an undeclared naval war uh, during the, uh, the Adams administration between the US and France, um, seems to confirm that this letters of mark clause that I had mentioned earlier, the idea that, that undeclared wars, Congress would still have power over them, seemed to confirm that that was not gonna be the case. The president really has the power over undeclared uh, war. And this is one of the most important foreign policy provisions of, of the constitution that does not seem to work as the framers intended. And this is a theme we're gonna be talking about a lot in this course, because we have a lot of these these uh, uh, quasi wars uh, carried out by uh, by the presidents. The question of why there there wasn't more uh, domestic pushback to Jefferson, I think, is is twofold. The first is Jefferson was an incredibly talented politician. He, um, to a much greater extent than than either Washington or certainly Adams, originates the idea of of, of what we would think of now as a president lobbying uh, Congress, trying to get his uh, uh, approaches through. He uses the the informal institutional powers of the uh, of the presidency. And secondly, as you can see from this map. <laughs> The, the Federalist Party kind of collapses during the Jefferson presidency. So in 1804, when Jefferson's reelected, the Federalists only carry the, 
the uh, uh, the orangey states here, you know, Connecticut and Delaware, and and a couple of electoral votes um, in in Maryland by 1812, the Federalists have have dramatically weakened uh, nationally. And by 1816, they're, they're out entirely because uh, a group of New England Federalists were perceived as um, being disloyal to the Union during the, uh, the War of 1812. So Jefferson outmaneuvers his domestic opponents and his partisan opponents collapse. And as a result, there's not a lot of, uh, of domestic pushback uh, to Jefferson's policies. Um, the second set of questions dealt with events in, in the Hawaiian annexation. Um, the uh, first here uh, deals with uh, what the Dole Pine Pineapple Company, uh, those of you who like canned pineapples, you're, you're, you're contributing to imperialism, um, had to do with the, uh, with the coup. Uh, the second uh, uh, question uh, dealt with the British and Japanese rivalry. And the third, which is a very interesting question of why the US was so late in acquiring a colony in Asia when it seemed like the rest of the world was in a race. The first one is the easiest. For, for um, from Dole's perspective, there was a concern that as long as the Hawaiian government remained independent, Dole, you know, Dole dramatically expands into uh, you know, the, the pineapple trade in the 19th century. They're, they're, they're sort of the dominant um, uh, company, um, but the but they remain an American company. So there's a fear that uh, a a non-American government might nationalize or tax or in other ways uh, th uh, threaten their holdings. So from their perspective, uh, an American governed Hawaii is basically good for, um, uh, for business. Um, with regard to the second question of, of, of the Japanese and, and British, there, there, there was some conflict. Um, the, this is a map of British possessions in uh, in the South Pacific in the late 19th century. Australia was a British colony. Uh, New Zealand was a British colony. Uh, Papua New Guinea was a British colony. A whole bunch of these uh, uh, island areas are under British control. The British also have uh, a move into Samoa, which they jointly control with the U.S. and um, uh, and the Germans. Um, so they're playing a role. The the Japanese role in some ways is more interesting. Japan seeks to expand in, into Hawaii, not militarily. There's, there's no uh, ostensible threat of a, like a Japanese invasion of Hawaii or anything like that. Uh, but instead, economically and especially demographically, it's a very significant wave of Japanese uh, immigration to, uh, to Hawaii in the uh, mid and late 19th century. And this, this, can, you know, this remains, the effects of this remain in place uh, until today, like around a quarter of the population of uh, current day population of Hawaii is of Japanese ancestry and it, it dates in large part from this uh, this this wave and the Japanese thinking here were was that if um, a significant portion of the Hawaiian population was Japanese that would by in itself draw Japan, uh, draw Hawaii into uh, into the Japanese uh, orbit and some of the pressure for annexation from Dole and from other American uh, business interests in Hawaii was this fear that uh, this wave of Japanese uh, immigration was kind of displacing the United States as a dominant foreign power in Hawaii and, uh, and, and Japan replacing it. So Hawaii was very much a site of this uh, Pacific strategic rivalry between the three major um, uh, uh, naval uh, powers in the Pacific, the, the US, Japan, and Great Britain. Um, this is obviously not the last time we're going to be seeing this rivalry uh, play out over the course of the uh, of the semester. And then the last question of why the U.S. was so late to uh, to decolonize. What, one of the things, to me anyway, that distinguishes U.S. foreign policy from that of of, of most other countries in the world is that domestic politics play uh, an unusually stark. Um, uh, and usually a direct role in uh, in the making of U.S. foreign policy, and there is a strong anti-imperialist tradition, and to a certain extent, it remains present uh, uh, today, but very strong in the 19th uh, uh, century. Um, it's not, it's, it, although there are some you know, sort of left-wing types who have it, um, it's a lot of conservatives who sort of also see the United States as a country founded in uh, an anti-colonial revolution and argue that the taking of colonies is simply contrary to the American creed. Uh, this is a photo of Grover Cleveland, uh, the, the only Democratic president 
uh, of the Gilded Age and the only president in American history to serve two non-consecutive uh, terms, the former, former mayor of Buffalo. Um, uh, in Cleveland, uh, even after the Hawaiian coup, Cleveland refuses to annex Hawaii. He resists pressure to annex uh, uh, Cuba, um, in part because he doesn't see this as, as um, as reflecting traditional American uh, ideals. After the annexation of the Philippines, there's this organization called the Anti-Imperialist League, which is the largest foreign policy, grassroots foreign policy organization in American history until that uh, time, uh, protesting uh, the acquisition of a US colony in, in the region. So unlike say France or, um, or Britain, there's a real domestic pushback in the United States uh, to the acquisition of, of a colony, which really isn't overcome until the McKinley and Roosevelt administrations of the, uh, of the turn of the, of, of the century. And then the last uh, couple of questions dealt with Cuba. Um, the first was, is the Platt Amendment still active? And the second uh, asked for more information about the Teller Amendment. So remember the Teller Amendment was the amendment attached to the Declaration of War that said the United States would not acquire Cuba as a colony in the aftermath of the war. And the Platt Amendment was the document of basically forcibly inserted into the Cuban constitution, saying that the United States, uh, uh, that Cuba uh, voluntarily giving the United States to intervene uh, in Cuban domestic uh, affairs and to send troops uh, to, uh, uh, to pacify the, the island whenever the United States decided to, uh, uh, to do so. On the first question, uh, the answer is no. The Platt Amendment is abrogated by the, the Franklin Roosevelt administration as part of this policy that Roosevelt calls the good neighbor policy. And we'll be looking at that when we get to the 1930s. Basically what Roosevelt wants to do is to move away from US military and overt diplomatic intervention in the Western hemisphere um, with a goal of encouraging a greater degree of solidarity among Western hemisphere countries. Um, and then on the practical side, there was this sense that the Platt Amendment in, in some ways was, was more harm than good. It kind of drew the United States in to resolve domestic Cuban political disputes, even if the US didn't have much of an interest to, uh, to do so. So Roosevelt was able, you know, was, was willing to get rid of the, uh, of the Platt Amendment because he hoped that it would benefit the US uh, uh, diplomatically, but also there was this sense that maybe it hadn't worked as, as, as they had intended. On the Teller Amendment, Teller was, is, is an interesting guy. He's a Republican senator from, from uh, Colorado. This is a period in American history where um, you know, th th these are not the modern uh, uh, Democratic and Republican parties you know, that we see today in Congress, where you know, basically we have this parliamentary system where the Democrats vote together almost all the time and almost all the Republicans vote together all the time. There are significant areas of disagreement within the, uh, the parties. I mentioned this uh, uh, Robert La Follette group um, uh, from the upper Midwest earlier, we'll be looking at a lot more in the next uh, in the next couple of weeks. Teller, by contrast, uh, who is a Colorado senator, um, represents a, a, a faction called the Silver Republicans. And these are mostly from Rocky Mountain or Western states. Um, uh, the US at this point is, is, is uh, on the gold standard. So the, the value of the US dollar is pegged to, uh, uh, to gold. And in theory, if you want to, you know, you can go to any bank in the country, you know, take a dollar bill and say, you know, I want this, a, a certain equivalent in gold, which is established by the, uh, by the government. Um, and the, the effect of this is to limit the amount of, of payment paper currency called greenbacks, um, depending on how much gold the, the US government possesses in, in, in Fort Knox. The, the silver Republicans want to make the, um, uh, the US a, a silver and gold currency. Um, partially because uh, if you have more um, uh, um, raw mineral uh, uh, deposits, that means you can print more paper. You inflate the currency, which basically helps debtors and hurts creditors, hurts people that owe, uh, uh, you know, that hurt, helps people that owe debts and hurts people that uh, uh, that that have. Uh, 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 payments uh, coming in. Um, so there's a kind of a political re uh, approach, but also Teller um, and these these Western Republicans like the idea of, uh, of, of a silver backed currency because there's lots of, of silver in their states. And so if silver suddenly becomes relevant to the US currency, that will drive the price of silver up. It will help uh, states like, uh, like Colorado. So Teller and senators like Teller don't have tons of loyalty to the national Republican uh, party 
which they see as overly solicitous of business interests and, and not interested in their concern. The, uh, the McKinley uh, and Roosevelt administrations uh, uh, don't uh, have, have much enthusiasm for silver um, inflation. So, you know, when the Cuban uh, uh, conflict begins, when it looks like it's, it's, there's a good chance of the US entering the war, Teller, who already is kind of primed not to trust the uh, McKinley administration, comes forward with his amendment. And it, it's, a, it's an excellent counterfactual to wonder what would have happened if there had been no Teller Amendment. And I suspect that the US would have formally acquired Cuba under those circumstances. Um, but once Teller introduces his amendment, given that the US is technically, it's saying that it's fighting for uh, uh, Cuban liberation, um, it becomes impossible politically for the McKinley administration to, uh, to oppose it. So it winds up getting attached to the Declaration of Independence. And it does, at least in a minimal way, bind US policy towards Cuba in the aftermath of the uh, of the war. So that's it for the questions for this week. Hope everyone is staying safe and I will talk to you soon.